I'm Sam from Darmstadt, and I want to talk to you what we are doing during the pandemic. Some remark, there are many hyperlinks into the slides, so if something is interesting to you and you want more information, you can just click on the underlined parts in the slides. One problem with the pandemic is that about 60% of the infections are pre- or non-symptomatic cases, but the diagnostic infrastructure is massively overloaded, no matter which country you look. And therefore, there is a need for cheap and fast tests so that you can actually sample the infection as they happen. If you look at the standard method, it is QPCR, we'll talk about that later, that has a wrong, big problem with a wrong negative rate. Here is a modeled curve, and if the symptoms symptoms start, the false negative rate is always st all, still 38%, and that's a problem if you think that the pre- and asymptomatic cases are the ones that actually produce the infections and the wrong negative rate is one sample point during the infection is always quite high. It's quite difficult to do pandemic management and like quarantine measures do only work if they start early enough and are carried out consequently. So to the resources, the standard method is difficult, and the other is that the global production capacity for the standard method is not that high. So to see in May 2020 was like 60 million tests per week. If you look to the global south, like Latin America, Africa, and Oceania, you have less than 1.5 million tests per week that are produced. And that is a problem because the pandemic is a global event. It cannot be solved locally. And therefore, the equal access to biotechnology is necessary, not only for this pandemic, but also for other pandemics in the future. And there I've met the Open Bio Lab from Cambridge that look at uh, expired patents from biotechnology and the critical resources and the knowledge to produce things, public them free of cost. And Jenny Milloy, the head of that lab, is also doing research on the economic uh, impact of an open bioeconomic. So maybe it's even something good if to go away from patents and could produce global progress. And in this context, the network reclone is, has been um, formed. I look at the talk from Jenny. You can click on the hyperlink for this network. Yeah, but back to us biohackers. I count myself in that number, although I've only started relatively recently. If you need an open source ask of two quick tests, so what do you need that? You need some crazy biohackers that meet in an online maker step that's actually a Slack standard more or less. We got some funding through this. And over that Open Bioeconomy Lab and the Free Genes Project that distributes the critical resources. And we got some resources, and there were previous work we could build upon. And we could um, develop a SARS CoV 3 screen method that can be produced and used locally. A few words on the basics, so we are on the same page with that. What you see here is the central dogma of molecular biology. We have DNA, that's yeah, the genetic information, stores all the information. And if you just want one gene, so one one particular information, when you read that out, it will be transcribed into a RNA. And these some molecular machines, like called ribosomes, 
attached to that RNA and they then produce the proteins and those proteins are everything that makes things alive. They are chemical catalysts that uh, uh, perform reactions and there are structural proteins and there are yeah, really interesting things. One cool thing is that there is one special protein that's used to uh, copy DNA. That's called DNA polymerase. And every cell needs that, every organism needs that. If you cut yourself with a wound, it, it heals, and um, that requires, that happens because the cells uh, split and new cells and they need a new genetic information that happens because the DNA information can be copied. In this mechanism, this self-replication mechanism we use in biotechnology and we put that in a syntactic reactor, in a you know, reactor, and when instrumentalize this uh, this reaction to copy DNA ourselves. This is the basis of the method method of the what health organization uses as a standard diagnostic method to uh, detect SARS CoV two. I've seen here a video from you stick, you see the reactor, it's a thermal cycler where everything is in. And here you see the DNA polymerase, it actually looks like that. It just glides along the string of strand of DNA. And you can see little pieces of DNA that the DNA polymerase uses. It's called primer. And they are the complementary part to the genetic sequence in the SARS CoV 2 genome. And so we know if if the sequence isn't isn't there, it doesn't find anything, and then we know okay, this sequence was not was not present in our my my solution, or it wasn't depending yeah, and then we know if there was an infection there. For this, we use this DNA polymerase. How to, yeah, for normal PCR, the evaluation, you have a temperature diagram, you you melt the double strengths by about 90 degrees, then you reduce so the primers can bind, then the DNA polymerase requires 72 degrees, it's usually extracted from bacteria from hot springs, that, that's how it can work above 37 degrees. And you yeah, repeat this a few times, and then you can separate them by size, or you use real-time PCR, and you can see the result here. There's a fluorescent tag which you can add to the primers, and then can you see in real time if it's strongly amplifying or not, because the fluorescent signal changes. So that you, have, you see photons at a specific wavelength. And these machines, of course, extremely expensive. So this is not a method that can be used for screening reliably and sustainably. What we did, and not only our group, Biohackers, but also several other community labs all over the world, that I know at least 80 groups from industry and academia that work on the same method that you use another method of some method of extraction so you have an amount of a test amount you put that in your erection vessels and you have a very very own PCR that similar to the method I uh, explained before that worked at a single temperature so that doesn't have the all the different temperatures. And then Guy develop a device that costs about two dollars where you can just detect this fluorescence visually. 
if you have the tech primers in your solution. Of course, you have no real-time readouts, but you had a final result, infected, not infected threshold has been reached. I'll talk about that later. But this in principle, the way it works. The cool thing is those 36 degrees, it, it's not it's not relevant for the reaction device how you get there. So I've seen people who just did it on a thermal mug. So it's really simple. You do not leave those several tens of thousands of euros machines. So in Darmstadt, specifically, we take this DNA polymerase and optimize it because only the build to for this reaction is no longer patented since 2016. All optimized versions are, are patented. And so we take the wild type and um, um, publish it, everything on the open material transfer agreement. So actually it's open source development, not reverse engineering and biohacking, but it sounds cooler if you call it biohacking. That's why we use it. So if you compare the two methods, there's classed by, with a standard method, which has its uses, you measure the virus load in your virus load, how many in your sample, you uh, replicate a specific part, which is expression exp important for research because you can do post-processing. And from 100 virus genomes, you get about 100 billion specific uh, parts. And I know some groups from Latin America who open source this kind of this kind of test and have been successful is that you have the hyperlink in the in the ground you can if you want more you can look in detail how this method works and how, how it works but yeah but it's time and hardware it needs time and hardware and personal our method RT lamp the RTs did with a reverse transcriptase so the RNA from the virus must be translated back into DNA because we can, so we can replicate DNA because RNA is not that stable and there's no good method to replicate it. So we always go back a step to DNA and then replicate it. They have a binary outcome, it's either infected or not infected. Or we have a threshold, so the LOD, so the limit of detection has been reached or has not been reached. So we we target a threshold of 100 virus genome, depends a bit how clean the sample is. But we want to use not non-cleaned cellular samples, and that ends with about 10 trillion of those T target samples. It's quite fast and easy, but you can even see if the solution becomes cloudy, if the solution happened or not. But this does only this does only happen if those crystallization starters, those starter tags, are present in the solution. Those are team Guy and Rachel did a lot of the fluorescent method, Sarah and Ellen, and also Scott and Guy do work on the on drying, drying the samples so you don't have no cooling chain that you have to keep off. And Sarah and Ellen are on the RNA extraction. Here the team from Sri Lanka, they have their own kit and protocol running but that still works on basis on proprietary things. And for example, in Cameroon, they do develop much hardware where you can join, build on, and so on. Fernan is one of the QPCR people. There are many, many others. 
Ähm, genau. Okay, we time is hot. But if you want to talk, as you can speak a, meet us on the Slack channel. Yeah, those are our three projects in this area. You Rachel and Guy have a whole session for their Corona detective. You can also order plasmids by uh, Free Genes, the Stanford project that are supplied us. You can find protocols for enzyme production and cleaning, very special only for biologists. You can look into the Reclo network. And what's not so, what might be interesting for you, the open science hardware movement that, that yeah, well, things are coming together there. And you can just look into that forum if you want to. And important, if you want to get around patterns, you must understand them. And there's a very good resource, lens.org, with a meter search engine. Yeah, thank you. And um, back to the Herald. Thank you for you. We have to quit here because we're already over the time. Um, okay, take your waist out if you leave the room, and we'll see you in 10 minutes in the next talk. Thank you.